always very stressful to speak after so many eminent uh, speakers have gone before you. But good morning, Dr. Yo Seng Beng, President Nature Society Singapore, Dr. Mark Borton, Dr. Paul Shin, co chairs of the IUCN Horseshoe Craft Specialist Work Group, and Mr. Tan Bitek, uh, RWS, uh, Mr. Mark Barclay, Mandai Nature, Ms. Wang Ning, and Parks, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join you at this year's International Horseshoe Crab Workshop organized by the IUCN. Um, this is the first to be held since the COVID-19 pandemic started and it's a wonderful opportunity for participants to exchange ideas, share research findings and build partnerships across borders and disciplines. I'm told that the past runs of the workshops were held in locations within the spawning range of the world's four existing horseshoe crab species. And they were held in places like Hong Kong and Long Island, New York. This year's workshop in Singapore is no exception. We are home to two horseshoe crab species, namely the mangrove horseshoe crab and the coastal horseshoe crab. As a small city, island city-state, we are fortunate to have a rich trove of biodiversity. At the same time, we face intense land use pressures from a range of needs, for example, housing, defense, transport, industry, needs of both a fully functioning city that also is a country. <laughs> this means we have to plan very carefully and intensify our land use in order to strike the balance between conservation and development. So to this end, we seek to take a science-based approach towards biodiversity conservation. And this is guided by the National Parks Board's Nature Conservation Master Plan, which sets up strategies to safeguard key native plants and animal species, as well as terrestrial and marine habitats in Singapore. Now this includes mangrove and coastal habitats where horseshoe crabs reside. The Conservation Master Plan also safeguards networks of nature parks island-wide. These parks are normally established at the edges of our nature reserves, and they serve as green buffers that protect the flora and fauna within nature reserves from the full impact of development. Horseshoe crabs are remarkably resilient living fossils that serve important ecological functions in their habitats. For example, their foraging releases trapped nutrients in their local environments, and the eggs are a food source for certain bird species, such as migratory birds. A decline in the horseshoe crab population would negatively impact the ecosystems that they live in, which speaks to the importance of protecting them amidst pressures like habitat loss and overharvesting. It is therefore the focus of this year's workshop, which seeks to develop a conservation action plan for Asian horseshoe crabs. Now let me briefly share about the conservation of horseshoe crabs in Singapore. Uh, they are frequently encountered at Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, as uh, Dr. Yeo had mentioned, as well as Mandai Mangrove and Mudflat. These mudflats along the northwestern shores of Singapore are possibly the last known local breeding sites of the mangrove horseshoe crab in Singapore. Therefore, the conservation of these mangrove and mudflat sites is vital to ensure the survival of this vulnerable species. We gazetted Sungai Bulo as a nature reserve in 2002. The same year, it was recognized as a site of international importance for migratory waterbirds. It was also designated as an ASEAN Heritage Park in 2003. My colleagues at MPARCS have also sensitively conserved several ecologically important sites around Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve over the years including the 31 hectare wetland reserve extension and the Kranji marshes, which opened in 2014 and 2018, respectively. In 2018, we also announced plans to protect Mandai Mangrove and Mudflat as a nature park, and this site had originally been zoned for industrial use. In 2020, we announced the Sungai Bulo Nature Park Network, which safeguards a variety of ecologically complementary habitats buffering the Sumai Bulo Wetland Reserve, such as Mandai Mangrove and Mudflat, 
and is part of a holistic conservation approach to protect and extend our natural capital. I hear that some of you will be visiting Sungai Wetland Reserve, and I hope you take the chance to visit the whole network as well, and I hope you have a fruitful visit. Well, since he did mention uh, his experience with horseshoe crabs, I first encountered horseshoe crabs in the early 80s. Because as a child, uh, every year end, uh, sometimes twice a year in June as well, I would spend at the uh, chalet in Changi, around Changi village. Those of you of my age remember that those were Hey days for Shelley holidays. <laughs> uh, and you know, growing up in Singapore, we tend to think it's all an urban city until we go out into the open. And uh, when the tide recedes, the intertidal zone was both, for me, during the school holidays, uh, an open air uh, classroom because of the rich marine habitats that uh, inform uh, us as children but also wonderful playgrounds uh, to learn about the outdoors. And it was in the 80s, every single time we were there, we would encounter uh, uh, the horseshoe crab. Uh, sometimes you'd see a fisherman who would say, oh, if you eat the roe, you will have twins. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never tried. <laughs> so I got three kids. But not <laughs> and uh, many years later, in 2013, not sure whether that's the numbers, and uh, we, we went to the Mandai Mangrove and Mark Kong Popping, remember, you organized that, uh, you organized a trip in 2013, and when we went to Mandai Mangrove and Mark Clyde with canoeing, uh, we encountered the uh, horseshoe crab, and that's the pointed out to me, a small little horseshoe crab, and that triggered memories of my earlier childhood when we encountered this ancient species uh, off the coast of what as a child you'd imagine would be a very urban Singapore. So that just underscores the importance of protecting habitats in our city state. In fact, other conservation efforts include NSS's or Nature Society Singapore's horseshoe crab rescue and research program, uh, which rescues horseshoe crabs trapped in fishing nets at the Mandai Mark Flat. Such effort, efforts are important to ensure that our horseshoe crab populations are protected and can continue to, to grow. The conservation status of the coastal horseshoe crab has progressed from endangered to vulnerable currently, the same as that of the mangrove horseshoe crab. There are estimated to be between 250 to 1,000 mature individuals of each species locally. This progress was only possible because of dedicated conservation efforts in close collaboration with our community partners, but we have to keep at it. Research and conservation go hand in hand. We must continue to grow a deeper understanding and knowledge of the horseshoe crabs in order to better guide our conservation work locally and internationally. For example, the National University of Singapore's Asian Evolution Lab focuses on the study of the genetics of horseshoe crabs, as well as other avian fauna species. This lab is led by Dr. Frank Rind, who will be sharing about his work later today. NUS has also collaborated with Republic Polytechnic to study the genetics of horseshoe crabs. This effort is led by Dr. Laura Yap, who is also a member of the workshop scientific committee. Professor Ding Jiap Ling from NUS had also developed a synthetic alternative to horseshoe crabs blood in the 2000s. Horseshoe crabs are highly sought after as their blood clots when it comes into contact with bacterial toxins. This has resulted in the capture and bleeding of horseshoe crabs for use in sterility checking testing for bacterial endotoxins to ensure the safety of drugs and medical devices. So this substitute known as recombinant factor C is recognized in many countries, which helps to relieve the commercial pressure on the horseshoe crab populations. I understand that Professor Ding will be sharing more about her research later today. I would also like to take this opportunity to give everybody a brief update on the oil spill incident that happened last Friday afternoon at Pasir Panjang Terminal. As I'm sure many of you here, both Singaporeans and friends from abroad, will be particularly concerned about its impacts to our coastal and marine habitats. 
Our agencies responded quickly and have been working together since to coordinate efforts to clean up and mitigate the immediate impact of the spill to our coast, coastal and marine environment. Upon being notified of the incident, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore deployed patrol craft to manage the leakage, alerted agencies and waterfront facilities, and has been coordinating the multiple agency response since. The National Environment Agency, or NEA, has been supporting the beach cleanups and conducting daily air quality tests at affected areas to ensure public safety. Sentosa Development Corporation stopped all water activities at the beaches on Sentosa and commenced cleanup operations to remove oil from the cold waterways. At sea, agencies have deployed oil recovery systems to track the oil and facilitate the cleanup of oil. Agencies have deployed one and a half kilometers of booms so far and will add a further 1.6 kilometers of booms over the next few days in designated areas. As some oil has been seen off Changi, we have also preemptively deployed booms around biodiversity sensitive areas such as Chek Jawa, wetlands at Pulau Ubin, Coney Island Park, and Pasiris Park as preventive measures. On our shores, our frontline responders are carrying out professional cleanup operations at impacted beaches. The National Parks Board is also monitoring the post impact recovery of coastal and marine habitats and will assess if habitat restoration efforts are further required. Singapore's waterways are some of the busiest in the world, used for industry, shipping, sport and recreation, fishing, defence, agriculture and a lot more. Close to a third of the world's hard coral species have been documented in our waters. Our waters are also home to over 100 species of reef fish and about 200 species of sponges. This oil spill, therefore, has a wide-reaching impact and the incident is still unfolding. It will take some time to carry out the cleanup operations and fully assess the extent of the environmental impact. We will then have to embark on recovery and restoration work. We have received strong support from the public. Over 1,500 people have reached out to us over the course of a few days to sign up as volunteers and to offer their services. Organisations including the Singapore Veteran Association, World Wide Fund for Nature Singapore, Singapore Canoe Federation, Friends of the Marine Park and many more NGOs and organisations have offered to chip in. I'm grateful for the strong support from the community. For safety, volunteers will not at this point be deployed for beach cleanup. We understand that many though want to pitch in to help. We have activated around 160 volunteers to help with beach patrols and monitoring efforts at East Coast Park and West Coast Park. This includes volunteers from the Public Hygiene Council who have helped with park maintenance and volunteers from the Friends of the Marine Park and from public sign-ups. In fact, Friends of the Marine Park, including Marine Stewards, TMSI uh, and many more organisations have have volunteered to help conduct biodiversity surveys at the Southern Islands over the weekend. Subsequently, we may seek volunteers' help to join my colleagues to carry out post-impact habitat and biodiversity surveys, as well as habitat restoration efforts. So in closing, I'd like to officially declare this International Horseshoe Crab Workshop open, and I wish everyone a rewarding time at the International Horseshoe Crab Workshop. To our international friends, I hope you have an enjoyable visit to Singapore and experience rich biodiversity and nature during your stay and also see the community in action responding to the impact on our environment. So with that, good morning and thank you.